Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Depends upon where you are in the world. My name is Bill Gustin, captain with the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department in Florida. And where am I? I'm in the air conditioning, thank God, because the heat index today is well over 100 degrees. So I'm where I should be, in the air conditioning. Uh, and uh, we have uh, our topic today is going to be, because it's hotter than blue blazes in almost every part of the country except the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, Daryl. Okay, don't gloat, Daryl. So, um, anyway, I'm the oldest guy in the room, and then I'm going to turn it over just uh, so he can make a quick introduction to the second oldest guy in the room that will be uh, Captain Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Um, hello from beautiful New York. It's 87 degrees here, and we're going to have a great topic today. Thank you. Okay, and then, Chief Boy, uh, you, uh, I want you to tell a little bit more about yourself because you are you are indeed our special guest uh you definitely in your part of the world where you're at in north carolina deal with a lot of heat you've been getting quite a a, a few serious fires lately could you just give us a little bit about your background starting with my well actually before miami dade miami dade and then what you're doing now yeah bill thanks great being here um been in the fire service for about 35 plus years, started out as a volunteer in North Carolina and after college went down and uh, joined Miami-Dade, Metro-Dade at the time fire department, 29 years there, uh, finished out as the division chief of special operations, retired, came back to North Carolina um, near Raleigh, a small town named Morrisville, was the fire chief there for a little while and now um, um, after a few, a uh, year and a half there, I moved over to a combination department, Northern Wake Fire Department, which was a combination, a merger of three smaller departments, and now is the largest combination department in North Carolina. And we're located in the uh, Research Triangle, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area of the state. And much like the rest of the country, today we're dealing with oppressive heat. Uh, upper mid 90s with a heat index of 103 as i just checked a few minutes ago and it's one o'clock in the afternoon so Chief, that's my could you elaborate on uh getting used to a different type of construction a different demographic a different design of structures uh when you went from miami dade to uh the raleigh area yeah, so, you know, in the South Florida building codes uh, built for the wind resistance, um, uh, mostly CBS, steel, heavy construction like that versus coming back to North Carolina, the area that I'm in now, Northern Wake, uh, just north of Raleigh, our average single family home is 6,500 square feet, wood frame. Most of the construction is within the last 20 years. Um, when I left North Carolina in 1987, this area had about 250,000 people. Now we're over a million and growing every day. Uh, the, the metro area, not Northern Wake in particular, the metro area of Raleigh. Um, and the, the construction is, is just exploded. And, the, you know, you and I have talked from time to time about the challenges. Um, we're in what's called the watershed which um, we surround or part of the reservoir for Raleigh, which is the uh, uh, falls of the Noose Lake. So we're very limited on what we can do or because of the rules to put in domestic water supplies. So about 95% of what we deal with are tanker shuttles. So versus South Florida, where there's pretty much a hydrant everywhere here, um, our initial assignment here gets five elliptical, uh, sorry, um, Daryl out in California, tankers here don't have wings. <laughs> so, <laughs> fire truck, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing out five tankers on the initial dispatch. So um, it's, it's, it's definitely different than urban firefighting, but we have a lot of the same challenges. Limited manpower, you know, I'm singing the, the same song that most of the country sings. You know, I'm, I'm super lucky if I have four members on an engine. Most of the time I have three and then relying a lot fill out the assignment with the um the tankers and um so it, it's a super challenge well i sure appreciate you being here boy and, and no, thanks for having me 
and I love coming up to your area to uh, to visit. Except uh, you have a great house, but you got rid of your you got rid of your chickens, man. You had a, <laughs> how many chickens did you have in that? Uh, had, the most at one time was thirteen. Thirteen chickens, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, he ate every one of them, and that's why they're not <laughs> there anymore. Okay, they're high in cholesterol. Right. All right, Daryl Liggins. I caught the tail end of your conversation about the uh, 4th of July festivities in Oakland, oh, yeah. California. I don't know how much of that you want to share, but I know it would be highly entertaining if you could relate some of your experiences. Well, I, I have no idea why there are so many fireworks in the city of Oakland because they are illegal. So I thought anything that's illegal just would happen, <laughs> but it looked... I haven't been to Afghanistan or Beirut, but it looked uh, like a lit up night sky for hours and hours. I think people are just trucking this stuff in from Nevada or something. Nevada. Uh, so it was quite entertaining. Uh, the fire engine is no deterrent for people lighting off fireworks. I think we were a target for them to aim at or shoot over, but uh, we really fared well well, we didn't really have any serious structure fires like in, in years past. So, Daryl, uh, why are you wearing a job shirt on a hot summer day? You want to explain that? To <laughs> well, it's it's a balmy sixty four degrees, <laughs> and we're gonna hit a high of seventy one. Oh, later, so. that's murder! So we really have a a cold snap <laughs> going on here. So I gotta say, bundled up. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to give a shout out to our sponsor in just a moment, but uh, I think our next uh, panelist probably knows more about operating in hot weather than, than, and than any of us combined. Clark, you want to tell a little bit about your situation? Uh, yes, good morning uh, from Las Vegas, city of Las Vegas uh, on the West Coast. It's... Uh, I'm just looking at my at my screen right now. It is 10 o'clock in the morning, and that's what I'm looking at. And we are going to have a high of 107 today, 108 tomorrow, and 109 on Friday. So that's what we're looking at here. But it's a dry heat, right? It's a dry heat, so it's fantastic. Uh, Clark Lamping with the Clark County Fire Department, Station 11 on Las Vegas Boulevard. Um, speaking of speaking of Fourth of July. Uh, people in Las Vegas really, really appreciate 4th of July. We responded to 160 fires on the 4th of July. Um, they set everything they could on fire, houses, grass, shrubs, dumpsters, trees, you name it. Uh, all, the, all the units in the 3rd Battalion, they just went from call to call to call. We had fires actually pending on the MCT. We couldn't even fight all the fires we got. They were cutting put hose down. They were telling apparatus, just drop your hose. We'll bring it back to the station tomorrow. So that's, that's how we did 4th of July in Las Vegas. Well, thank you, Clark. And uh, I'm look, very much looking forward to coming to your wife, Bonnie's birthday party. Uh, and I expect an abalming, what, uh, 111 degrees or something in August in Las Vegas. Well, it'll be the party will be at night, so it should be a comfortable about ninety nine at Very good. nine o'clock at night. Very good. Starts. All right, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Key Hose. You can reach them at keyhose dot com. I'll show you this here, not not that picture here. I want you to, if you're looking for new hose, don't go cheap. Key Hose is not cheap. They have various grades. But their top of the line is the combat ready. And I challenge you to take the key hose challenge. That is, tie this stuff up into a knot. Make it into that, uh, what's that load of card? It's named after a city in uh, Ohio. I, the name escapes me right now, that load. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I it won't come up on my lips for some reason. It's, it's like a nervous tip. <laughs> anyway. You cannot Cincinnati, Bell, Cincinnati. Uh, the Cincinnati load. Excellent. Yes, it's called the Cincinnati load. And I, I challenge you to try to kink that hose. It is just in, in, has incredible kink resistance, uh, great durability for abrasion and heat resistance. Um, again, it's it's not cheap, but it's it's the best that money can buy. There, there's various grades. Um, my department. 
uses the uh, the combat ready for our uh, uh, our inch and three quarter, our two inch high rise hose, and, and our three inch. Uh, and we are now purchasing uh, almost exclusively key hose for our large diameter five inch. Uh, whereas uh, Mike Dugan's department, they spec a uh, a special hose for them. It's called the FDNY uh, spec uh, that we're going to be looking into. And uh, there's also a new product on the market, the uh, True ID 2.25 hose. It's no longer a prototype, it's available. 2.25. And uh, we've got a few sections of it, and it is uh, so far very promising. And the 2.2 and a half. So um, I think what we can do now is. I, 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 everybody's a, I'm a closet FDNY buff that's out of the closet, okay? I've always been a, a great admirer of FDNY. Mike, I, I look forward to perhaps you relating some of your most uh, memorable uh, 4th of Julys. I know that's, uh, that's also heat related, but I know it gets kind of crazy in some of the boroughs in the, uh, in the Big Apple on the, uh, around that time of year. Well, Bill, it did. It doesn't anymore. Crime is down. Uh, it's crazy. I don't think Brooklyn broke a thousand runs this Fourth of July for the whole twenty-four hour period, which is insane. Um, I remember we used to do over ten thousand because they have to reset the computer. Um, and uh, now I remember being a fireman up in Harlem and working on the Fourth of July, and it was. Fourth of July and New Year's Eve were the two best days to work because you guaranteed to go to fires. And I remember one time that any available truck company north of 100th Street, and we went all the way up to uh, Inwood, up into the 200s, any truck company north of 100th Street, we got a job waiting for you, any truck company. And there were probably 20, 21 truck companies north of 100th Street. And they're looking for just one to go to a fire. I mean, I remember going past vacant buildings on fire, probably similar to what they did in Las Vegas this year. Going past vacant buildings, rubbish fires, and everything else, because we had an occupied building that was on fire. And it was just, it was insane. It was so much fun. And um, that was back in the day. But it has changed dramatically with the um, positive policing, the Rudy Giuliani, you know, all the fireworks in the street. When Giuliani came in, they started arresting people for that stuff. And it kind of brought it all down to a little bit of a, a, a lower thing. It's still fun to be there, but it's not like it was. Um, I'm going to tell you my favorite heat story because it, it involves me as a young captain. And I was uh, new to the rank of captain, and we had a job, and we were first due. And it was 90-something degrees. THI was over 100 and we go in there and we get the fire knocked down and we did the search, the primary search, and we're doing a little bit of overhaul. And the chief comes over to me and it was a chief I really liked and respected. He said, Mike, come on, take the guys out. Let's take a blow. I said, chief, chief, we got this. These guys are good guys. They want to work. We got this. So he said, no, no, Mike, take a blow. I said, chief, really, we got this. He goes, okay. And we did it. And I told him, you know, we got another five minutes here. It's nothing big. We probably had another eight, maybe nine minutes. And we got all done. We came out. And the guys went to the rig. And the chief called me over. And he said, Mike, come here. And I walked over. And he said, turn around and look at you guys. And they're my guys. And they're dripping sweat. They're covered. It's one of those we used to call them a four or five t-shirt day. Because you're soaked through. They're covered. And he says, look at you guys. It's going to take about an hour for them to get back into any kind of shape to go to another job. I could have brought them out 10 minutes earlier when I asked you originally, and they would have been back in shape in 15, maybe 20 minutes. And he goes, now, turn around and look on, over your other shoulder. And there's the rapid intervention team, our fast crew. There's another truck waiting to do some work. He goes, those guys are fresh. They could have gone in. They want a piece of this too. He goes, remember, it's about the men, but it's also about the people we serve and their next job. 
And I will never forget that till the day I died because it was so perfect for what we did. And it made such sense to me. Then I then thought about it afterwards. Mike, I... I I don't wear my faith on my sleeve, but I pray to the good, good Lord uh, in the summertime when you get a, 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 a job and you're beat up. I mean, you're praying as much as we all want to go to fire. You're praying you don't get another fire until you get a little bit of a break. Uh, I uh, worked for a, uh, a chief that I uh, admired. And he told me that um, he does not want his company officers working to the point of physical exhaustion. Uh, that would include heat exhaustion. And because a fatigued officer is not making good decisions, uh, their judgment can be skewed. And the same would apply to uh, firefighters. Uh, there gets to be a point where you work uh, a firefighters. And, and you know that we work with some wonderful people. And I'm sure, Captain Mike, that your guys would have followed you anywhere. And they don't want to let you down. But uh, I learned that as an officer, you got to be the first one to take the knee. Because your guys are not going to do it. They're not, they're not going to do it. So you do it for them. You know? and, and I think that, that's an excellent lesson. But uh, your, your story is, uh, is absolutely true. A, uh, we got to think about the next job. Um, I worry about this department here when we've got, if we had four major fires uh, working at one time, you wouldn't be, we would have so many people go home and bring in people on overtime that we'd be in, a, in real, real trouble. And uh, so, Mike, can I ask you, everybody wants to know what, what does the FDNY do about this and that? What does the FDNY do both proactively and uh, after in terms of rehab to keep people from being overheated or getting heat exhaustion? Well, we have uh, the rack units, rehabilitation and care, and they go to all, all hands fires. Um, they're light duty firemen who are injured and can't be full duty firemen. And what they end up doing is they come with, uh, misting fans, they come with um, um, Gatorade to replace the electrolytes, they come with um, wet towels, which are some of the nicest things, soaked in ice, They're those those hand towels to put around your neck after you come out, just cool yourself down at the wrists, at the neck, and they come. On major fires, they will send um, the EMS response group and you will have to go through and do your blood gases and get checked for your O2 sat and everything else before they will let you go back to the firehouse. And what a lot of chiefs will do now is say over the air, uh, ladder one, two, three is going to be on R and R for one hour. End of story. So you can't go back and serve as early if a good sounding box comes into your, in your neighborhood. We used to do that. Hey, this sounds like it might be something. All right, put us back in service. We'll go. We'll take this in. Now the chief says over the air, no, one hour. Do not put them back in service for one hour. And you can't go back in service. You have to go back, take a shower. And again, this all kind of relates back to us doing our decon of ourselves cleaning ourselves off you can use those wet towels now to wipe yourselves off they come on every fire and we are trying to take care of ourselves proactively so we can be ready for the next job and decon and do the right thing for ourselves and and the, the people who pay us the citizens or the people we protect whoever it is we're doing the right thing yeah it, it the, the the shower is uh I mean, that is totally consistent with what we're, my department is doing now in terms of uh, decontamination. And it's, uh, it's just about any, anywhere in the country where there's progressive fire departments. Right. But, and you got to uh, change your hood. If your gear is wet, you got to put your secondary set of gear. And again, we're blessed. We have two sets of gear and we also have a quartermaster with extra gear if we have one of those nights. But you're going to take your gear out. You're going to change everything up and everything else. 
Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, Chief Foy, um, hi, up in that your area, the Raleigh, North Carolina area, um, are there what measures does your department or the area departments take both proactively and then in terms of rehab? Well, Bill, obviously, uh, you know, th coming from an area that's predominantly combination and limited staffing, if we get uh, in route, we're getting ad additional information or somebody seeing a header or something like that, we'll go ahead and add additional units right away um, to get those guys coming. Um, and that, that's the main thing here and not having a metropolitan system for the, the capability of automatic uh, backfill and move up companies, you've got to stay way ahead of your, of your uh, power curve on that. So that, that would be the, the most proactive. Um, within the departments ourselves, you know, the chief officers and everything are constantly uh, harping on the guys to stay prehydrated. Um, you know, when you come to work and drink a pot of coffee, which I'm as guilty as the next guy, you know, I'm hard headed, but trying to drink that, uh, water, uh, sport drink type things, um, the day before you come to work is the only way you can really stay ahead of, of the dehydration curve. And, and quite honestly, limiting a lot of what we're doing outside, you know, keeping the guys, uh, you know, we, if we're going to do any kind of company drills or anything like that. Try to knock them out really early or, or are they going to be late and try to stay out of the heat of the day? I mean, from 12, 1 o'clock, like we're in now, to about 7 here, it's just really unbearable outside. It's uh, not healthy. Um, luckily, excuse me, luckily the county EMS system runs our rehab uh, very aggressive. And they, and they, they send a full uh, EMS box to a working structure fire. Um, they have a... Uh, they call it truck one. It's a, a large utility type, uh, heavy rescue type truck that brings the same thing like the captain was saying, you know, the, the ice drinks, bottled water, um, any, any type of thing like that. The, the moist towels, misting fans, that type thing. And we're lucky enough here also that EMS has one of the um, mass casualty uh, buses. It's a bluebird type bus, like a metro bus. It's actually set up to take multiple, I think as many as 20 stretchered patients. They're able to fold those stretchers up, get the guys out of their gear, doff all their gear, come inside, you know, because when, quite honestly, when it's 103 heat index, getting out of your gear and standing outside, you're not going to cool off in a timely fashion. So getting those guys out of the weather, getting them in the shade, get them in some cooler air, uh, get some rehabbed a lot, a lot sooner. Uh, and, and able to get back to work. Uh, we have a very strict policy, how much they have to drink between bottles and, you know, sticking pretty much by the, um, the NFPA guidelines. And, um, you know, w one of the things before we came on air that um, I was talking to Clark about is part of the challenge here where I'm at now, I've never worked for a non-municipal department. I'm working for a non-profit private right now, uh, not for profit, private. And um, trying to figure out what our legality is. Just like I said, we're new on our and building the department up from the merger of three uh, basically combination departments. And what our legality is as far as our members, what can we really force them to do as far as, you know, when we were in Florida, if the chief said go to rehab and the chief said, oh, and, the, and the rehab group supervisor said, you're not clear to go, you went to the hospital. No questions asked. That's the way it is. Here, we're still trying to find our legal footing on if we can actually do that type thing or not, because we've had a couple incidents where guys, you know, that know the EMS guys, oh, well, he, you know, he needs to rest, but maybe not go to the hospital. We're going to have to be a, we're, we're all our own worst enemies when it comes to that. And, and like Cap was saying before, we got to take care of our guys um, because they're a detriment to themselves. Nobody wants to be that guy that can't get back on the scene and start working and get another bottle and everything. But the reality is you have to call for relief troops early. You have to rotate the guys out because, you know, um, back in the day, the heat didn't get to me like it does now. I mean, it takes me a couple of days to get over one of these fires and I'm outside most of the time, not inside uh, dragging hose or pulling ceiling. So as we age and it's just a continual hotter environment that we're dealing in, it's going to be uh, imperative to stay ahead of that as, as command officers. Um, 
Daryl, I know that you're not dealing with the extreme heat that uh, the rest of us are, so I'm going to pose a question to you because I know you're a career-long student of the fire service. Um, if you think about this, it's uh, 92 outside, and you're going to go out and cut your grass. Uh, would you bundle up like you were in Duluth, Minnesota in January? Of course, no, that people would think you're nuts. Well, that's basically what we're doing. So I'm just asking you and thinking out loud myself. Maybe are we overprotected? Now, I don't want to get into the whole, well, your ears are burning and, you know, you could, that tells you when to get out. I'm not, in, I don't, I'm not into using parts of your body as your personal thermometer. But it seems like there's a probability that you could be burned. Uh, possibility. Possibility. It's a certainty that you're going to be battling heat exhaustion all summer long. So what do you what do you think, Daryl? I mean, do you well, think that maybe we're a little out of balance that we're overly protecting our firefighters at the expense of heat exhaustion? Um, well, this is definitely my personal view and not the views of my fire department. Okay. Um, I, I like uh, some of you guys, I, I didn't come in when uh, you and Mike came in, but I came in in the 90s and we still had turnout gear that had rubber liners and, um, and we didn't have hoods, but we certainly had some issues uh, wearing that older type of gear. And even though we have modern gear now that is much more breathable, we have still added some things like like hoods, um, uh, gloves that have a vapor barrier and things that can add, add to, the, to the problem. So although we don't have extreme temperatures in the Bay Area, it's even more problematic in some ways because we're, when it does hit us, we're not as prepared as departments that deal with it all the time, like in, in Vegas and Miami-Dade. You guys are used to dealing with it. We're not used to dealing with it. So uh, back to wearing the gear, we have some strict uh, rules that all our engineers have to be in full PPE. Uh, I could see in, in the FDNY, sometimes those uh, chauffeurs are wearing shorts and tennis shoes. Sometimes they're, they're in less than full gear when they're doing non-firefighting tasks, and our members have to be uh, fully geared up. I'll share a quick story. We, when we did go to the hoods, we had a greater alarm fire where we were all out there for hours and hours, and it definitely was one of our hotter days <laughs> to memory for me. Um, and it was over about 107, it was about 107, 108 degrees. At that time, they passed out the hoods. They said we had to have them around our neck anytime you had on your SCBA. But you also have to have on your SCBA if you're at a fire. So although that we're at this job for like five hours, people are wearing this and it caused one of the battalion chiefs to have a heat emergency and they had to put him in his car, crank up the air conditioning. And um, I just felt like this, these hoods are not designed to be turtlenecks. They are designed to protect us from fire when we're actually engaged in firefighting operations. So um, yeah, I think sometimes we need to make adjustments to what our members are wearing um, on the perimeter of the of the building, you know, when that heat does strike us. Another thing is looking after the people. I remember something that um, Chief John Norman said. I took a class from him and he was talking about calling his guidelines for calling greater alarms. And your own people are one of the reasons you may call a greater alarm. If you're dealing with extreme temperature uh, extreme weather conditions, whether that's high winds, extreme cold, or extreme heat, that may uh, lead you to call a second alarm when on a normal day you wouldn't do that because you know you're going to go through your, your people faster. But, um, you know, the other thing with gear, um, most of our heat-related emergencies with our personnel have happened to our recruits. We just started an academy this month. They're going to be going through the summertime working hours and days on end. And um, I just caution people just not just to give them the old crappy gear, like I mentioned, that has rubber liners, but also look after their hydration and uh, 
making sure that they don't have some type of heat related emergencies themselves. Yep. Uh, about the recruits, uh, I want to give a shout out again to Key Hose. And if you want to test a piece of equipment, whatever it is, an appliance, a nozzle, hose, put it in recruit training where it every day it is dragged along the pavement. It's rubbed up against corners in a, a drill tower. That's where you put your equipment. To, um, to the test. We uh, in the training division have a wonderful working relationship with, uh, it's also called training and safety. Uh, so we're looking, whenever there's a new piece of equipment that's introduced uh, or is gonna be tried out on a trial basis from our logistics division, uh, we work very closely with them and they issue uh, that new hose, that new nozzle or SCBA, whatever it happens to be, and it's evaluated by the, the safety uh, folks uh, in my division, but also you're going to beat that stuff up in recruit training, and it's going to get some hard use. Um, so uh, the key hose, I know, I know how durable it is because I see it being dragged across the pavement five days a week all day long and it's it holds up beautifully so it might cost you a little bit more to go with key combat ready with the initial purchase but it's going to last you a heck of a lot longer in the long run um clark let me pose a question to you uh you were at a uh, an extra alarm fire in a uh, a warehouse and the building is like 500 by 500. And they want you to stretch, uh, team up with uh, several other companies and stretch f large diameter hose, five inch hose, a uh, thousand feet around to the Charlie side. Okay, hand stretched it. Can't get an apparatus in there. It's on a rail siding, can't get it in there. Would you personally, or would your department consider if you're not going to be near the fire, to strip off your, your coat and your SCBA and perhaps perform the evolution like that rather than be bundled up unnecessarily. Uh, yes, I we would do that, Cam. I would consider that a hose stretch operating in the warm zone, not in the hot zone. Now, provided there were no winds and there wasn't smoke, those guys weren't eating any smoke on the outside of the building. But yeah, when we're operating in the warm zone, we can use a reduced level of PPE. And uh, I would encourage encourage the individuals to drop their SCBAs, take their hoods off, definitely helmet, gloves, and, and boots, um, but um, take off take off their coats. And uh, anytime they're working like that, let's get that, let's get that gear off those guys. It's just ridiculous. The heat in Las Vegas is unbearable. It is miserable. And a stretch like that, a thousand foot stretch, of large diameter that could take out a whole engine company that could take out a whole engine company you do that one stretch and then those guys are going to rehab yeah they're, they're out of service yep yep even teaming up companies uh can you tell us a little bit about uh your recruit training because again they're 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 taking a beating they're you taking a beating. yeah and uh we are starting another academy uh 35 individuals will be starting on august 26th of this uh, of this year so um, they start them very early. They the recruits show up at five o'clock in the morning in the summertime. Class starts at six o'clock, and the first thing they do is that we go out. And we do our PT in the morning. You're a PT in the morning, <clears throat> and we do like a, a, a CrossFit type PT, a circuit workout. Do some running, do some stairs, and then they come back in and they go over some material, whatever the, the subject of the day is: ladders, hoses, rit, anything like that. And then they immediately go back out and they practice their tactical drills. On the drill ground and by this time it's still about 10 o'clock in the morning uh, after that the rest of the day is inside the rest of the day is inside classroom stuff um, book work things like that but we try to we try to keep them out of that heat as much as possible for extended durations of time now that doesn't mean we're, we're, we're babying them we still go out and drill in the heat because we have to acclimate to it but we just don't we don't subject those individuals to those extreme conditions for extended periods of time 
you know, life is not fair. And, uh, and I know it's a heck of a lot cooler at back uh, borderline cold in Las Vegas in uh, the wintertime. And uh, I tell the recruits that are going through the academy in the winter months, you don't know how lucky you are because the difference between going through the recruit academy in, say, December, January, February, and March, and <laughs> June, July, and August is totally, absolutely, just totally, life is not fair. I mean, those the poor, the recruits and the instructors in the summertime take a tremendous beating. Uh, we've talked uh, a bit about these. Uh, you get a lot of I don't want to call them nuisance calls because the, the department, the, the public is depending upon you to judge uh, if there is a serious situation in their building. Uh, but I understand a very common call for you, Clark, is the. Uh, the smell of smoke that comes from uh, rooftop air handlers, HVAC equipment. And uh, you, I understand you respond to those in great quantity. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Um, so it is, uh, majority of our buildings have roof mounted AC units and the call will come in, <clears throat> smell of smoke inside the building, light, light white smoke in the building through the vents, maybe a smell of rubber, maybe a smell of electrical that are definitely indicators. We have an AC problem on the roof and you know, these AC units are sitting outside. You touch the metal, the metal is 130 degrees on them. So they are taking a beating as well. The majority of the time they burn up belts, the uh, belts just get so dried out and burn up or we have an electrical fire in them. But as a truck company, now that it's a full alarm, obviously if you have smoke in a building, respond to full alarm. Truck company shows up and as soon as we start re reading the notes, the truck company, you get physical chest pain and your heart breaks because you know what you're going to be doing. So full gear, we're going to be in the hot zone. So what is full gear, SCBA, not breathing air, but as soon as we get their truck, go to the roof. Whatever, whoever's interior says, yep, confirmed. We have an electrical smell. We have a rubber smell. Uh, ACs were running. Now they're not running. This portion of the building, give me a quadrant of the building. Truck company, go to the roof um, and check on this quadrant of the building. Copy that. We ladder the roof. And as soon as you go past the parapet, whether you're using ground ladders, we're using the aerial. And undoubtedly, the roof decking is white. It's that bright yeah. white. Yeah. Yeah. Single Single white. And as soon as, as soon as you cross the parapet, you can feel yourself getting skin cancer. You can feel the skin cancer growing on your face. <laughs> And you have to enter that and you have to go and, you know, a Walmart, uh, Walmart, they might have 60, 60, eight roof mounted AC units. And we have to walk every single one of them. If it's running, it's fine. If it's not running, smell it, put the tick on it. If you have anything, uh, we carry a roof, we call it a roof bag with uh, nut drivers and things like that. Take it apart, visually inspect for wiring problems, visually inspect. And it's always the same. It's, you're going to see brown, uh, a ground up belt material, black belt material ground up. And we've spent hours on the roof just going AC unit to AC unit. And the roof is, the roof could be 125 degrees in full gear. Just, just miserable, just miserable. Okay. And that's, that's common call. We do that, you know, once a week, we're on a rooftop like that. Oh. Well, that was a great recruitment video for the Clark County Fire Department. I think it's uh, we, yeah. <laughs> you guys pay your dues, man. We yeah. all have our own private hell, I guess, our own way of suffering. Um, and I know that uh, also what the other problem, I don't like the guys to do a lot of working out. Uh, I don't want them playing basketball uh, during the hot, hottest time of the day. Invariably, they'll wear themselves out, and then they're going to get a um, then they're going to get a fire. Uh, right before I left the field, me, a guy that ought to know better, did uh, 150 stories on the stairmaster. Now I was in the air conditioning, 150 stories. And then we had an extended extrication that took about an hour and a half out on the street and not a bit of shade. And believe me, I was crying for my mama. And 
was that smart? No, it was, it was not smart at all. So, um, you know, we need to you tell that too. What's the that young guys, guys, you know, we have a Paul, I, Station 11 on the Strip. Uh, we're busy. We got our, we got our, we just get kicked in every day. And so they've sent us a lot of new guys because they can handle it. And so we have a policy at the fire, at my fire station, you're only allowed to drink three monster energy drinks a day. No more than three monster energy drinks. And these guys go out and they, they PT at the, at three o'clock in the afternoon, full gear. They set up a skills course, 117 degrees behind the station. And they do a 30 minute circuit workout. And I stopped these guys and said, Hey, you've got two, you got 29 years left in your career. Don't use it all up today. You're going to need to save something in the tank for for the next couple of years. Don't don't blow yourself out like this. And those energy drinks, they're killing, they're killing the guys. We've had two guys on our job, young, healthy men, have heart problems, permanent heart problems because of that. I was talking to another guy at the beach. I just got back from the beach. He was training for triathlons. He was drinking three and four Red Bulls a day. He's training for triathlons in the best shape of his life. He's a 31-year-old man. And he went down with uncontrolled AFib, and his doctor tells him, you have uncontrolled AFib for the rest of your life now. You're stuck with it. And there's no other reason that a 31-year-old athlete has uncontrolled AFib with no family history than drinking these damn energy drinks. They're killing our guys. Boy, that could be I was uh, talking to a friend of mine, Clark, recently, who is on one of the um, – the task force, the incident management teams, and they go out and travel all over. They're not allowed to drink them anymore. You cannot have one when you are out uh, deployed with these teams. You can't do it. The SEAL teams have stopped their guys from drinking those drinks because of the effects they can have on your heart. Um, again, I, I don't know if you've ever listened to Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, but his thing about coffee, I have two cups of coffee a day in the morning. That's it. Drink decaf the rest of the time because if you need it, you want it to work. If something is going on, you're at a major thing and you need that caffeine rush. If you, like I did in my career, drink two or three pots a day, yep. it's not going to have the benefit for you. So I honestly think it's a very, very good thing to limit the energy drink. We had a guy die in probie school. Um a muscle-bound guy and everything else, drinking the energy drinks and taking supplements. And he was so dehydrated, his kidneys shut down, and it ended up costing him his life in probie school in the best shape of his life. But he'd come in, work out before the thing, and then go through, and it was this time of year he was in probie school, and he went down and he passed away as a probie in the academy. Yeah, well, we've... we've uh... We live and we learn. One of the most punishing weeks I've ever spent in my life was in Ocala, Florida, at the Florida State Fire College Smoke Divers uh, program. And uh, you had uh, these instructors would say, y'all don't need to be drinking all that water. Just swish a little bit around in your mouth and spit it out. I mean, and you just went along with it. But, you know, now we know that's that's not only dangerous, that's that's criminal. I mean, that, that is the damage that, that can happen. And you read about these light, line of duty deaths uh, on the drill ground uh, because of um, heat related uh, cardiac arrest, uh, kidney failure. And it is a serious concern. So I think we've come a long way. I know, Clark, your department certainly has. And uh, you've learned to deal with it. And um, but I think we all we, we, we all were a little younger at one point and uh, a lot stronger. So a lot of the things that you say that these young guys do, we did it as well. Look at Mike is hydrating, except what we all know is that that is vodka that Mike just drank. Uh, it looks like water, but it, it was vodka. So. Um, Mike, you're setting a very poor example for some of our younger folks that are uh, that look up to you. And okay, <laughs> uh, so as I mentioned, there's a couple little things that um, some of our members do on on a hotter day, and I think it, it may not be a, a huge help, but I think uh, you know any steps are, are going to be beneficial on on these hot days that catch us off guard. 
One is um, we typically wear, you know, coats. We wear coats a lot, even on EMS calls and things like that. We're not required to, but just making a switch to, we have wildland gear as well as structure gear. Some members are going to choose to now wear their, their wildland coat on some of those incidents. They just want to keep their, their arms and sleeves covered up. And then, you know, throughout the runs of the day, it, it just slowly adds up to keep you a little cooler. I think everybody's going to throw on an, an ice chest on the rig with some, some cold water. But um, having a urine chart, you know, by the urinal, having that in the bathroom, if people are paying attention, that can really help. Uh, if anything, it's just a little bit of a reminder to stay hydrated. And we have that at our academy on the wall. I think it's, a, I don't think we have that in our firehouse right now, but it's a, that's a simple thing we could do. It's tape it on the wall and just let people remind themselves of how hydrated they could stay. But back to the heart thing, uh, it, it shouldn't be glossed over because this is the number one killer of, of firefighters, even, even right after a structure fire, you often hear this member that will have a heart attack and pass away right after a structure fire. And I think he has, you know, a lot to do with that. So when people can unbutton the, their coat and get their hood off their neck and stay cool, uh, and get some cold water in them whenever they can. And, uh, all of us like to work. We like to just work and prove ourselves as workers. That's one reason we like to go to fires is to prove something to ourselves and, and the people we're working with. And, uh, but we do have to remain professional and smart and realize once you've done, done enough work, it's time to let somebody else do something and, and you cool down. You know, uh, nobody wants to have a reputation of sitting on the, on the tailboard, uh, drinking water with their coat open. And that's, uh, that machismo is what can, can lead to problems so no one to tap out and and cool yourself down but really it has to come from the officers and the chiefs because we don't want to do that to ourselves and say uh i'm not going back to the pool ceiling <laughs> we, we <laughs> have these um, hey, 13 engine that's enough get some water and rehab we we have these rehab chairs that they fill with ice water and you sit in them and your arms are immersed in there <laughs> And it's been, there's been several occasions where members of the public have come up and said, look at that big fire and you guys are just sitting there. What the heck? Get up, get up there and help those firefighters. <laughs> and what do you tell them? We've got our bunker pants down around our ankles and we got our arms sitting in a, that looks like patio furniture out on the street or under a tree. And the public, they don't know what to think of it. Another I, a great idea, and I got to give credit to the, uh, the, the, the battalion chief and battalion five on the B shift. Um, once the rapid intervention team does its lap and does what it needs to do in terms of uh, softening the building or raising some ladders, whatever they're going to do, Get them back in the cab of an air conditioned apparatus because invariably first thing that comes off is the helmet and the hood and they open up the coat and you know next thing you know they're not they're not ready to be deployed in a rapid rapid fashion so um, that ought to be a, the, the procedure for just about any rapid intervention team in the uh, in the summertime I think I think it's a, it's a great idea. Uh, does anybody else have those kind of chairs or has anybody else ever had an experience where people come up and they have, they, they take issue with you uh, in rehab? Well, Bill, I the say, first thing I'm going to tell you is you've let the civilians inside the fire lines. you got to have the cops set up the fire lines. Okay. The second thing is, yes. We have we sit our people down after they come out. Well, we got somebody there taking their pulse, and most times people look at them and say, "Holy mackerel, those guys just gave 110 percent because they're sweating." I mean, I don't have any hair left, but the guys, their hair's matted. They're and I mean, you know, it's a killer. But I think the chairs are a great thing um, in a cooled um, response vehicle like the MER, the multiple uh, response vehicle for the, uh, you know, 
the EMS where you can put the people inside sitting down, where you can put your people. I think all of that is part of what we got to do because, like we said, heart attacks, we're killing these guys. And the other thing I want people to remember is if you're unbuckling and taking, if you can take your coat off, that's the best. But also unbuckle your pants and let your lower half breathe so that you get some of that air out of there. You get some of that heat. The first time I ever wore bunker gear, when I first got issued the bunker gear, back in the day when we had the three-quarter coats, we always wore turtlenecks during the winter to keep you warm. I had a turtleneck on, and we had a fire in a project, and it was on the 18th floor, and the elevators weren't working. Ran up 18 stories, fought the fire, and got done, and I walked out, and I'm ripping the turtleneck off me because I felt like I was a cork in a soda bottle that was about to explode because there was so much heat trapped in from the turtleneck, okay? I, that's, I brought the turtlenecks home. I would never wear them again, okay? You have to think about this, and it's individual. And as an officer and the people in charge, you have to empower the men and women who work for you to come up and tap your seat. We got enough, man. Okay? Because sometimes the brothers and sisters who are doing the job, the officers, you don't want to get burnt out, but the men and women who are doing the job, they've had enough. Yeah. I'm tapping out. Be, be the first one to take the knee. And then you say, okay, let's go. Everybody out. Hey, Chief, my guys, my guys, my girls, we've had enough. Let's go. And away we go. But you have to empower them to be able to come to you and say, We've had enough. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. Uh, how are we doing? Oh, we, we still got plenty of time. Um, Clark, any yes, other uh, experiences of, of a particular incident uh, where heat was, was a problem? Um, I'd say, Cap, in Las Vegas, it's, it's every day. It's every day, every fire. We just had a, a dumpster fire against a building yesterday that I was on, and uh, – just even finding an exterior fire, dumpster fire in full gear, we got whipped. We were done after a, a dumpster fire, a single dumpster fire, and the company was whipped. And fortunately, the battalion chief on scene, he kept every, you know, a dumpster fire, you usually keep one engine and set everyone's home. He kept in two engine companies there. And as soon as we were done, the other engine companies, they got off with no gear on and they rolled all the hose for us. They broke down the hydrant, rolled okay. the hose for us. They went interior. They took the, the CO readings inside the building. They talked to propers. We were done. We dropped our gear. The other engine company switched out our bottles for us. And that's it. We were done. And we had a heads up BC. Good on the second battalion. Heads up BC recognizes the stuff and makes accommodation for us. So that is that that is that is great. Yeah, and it feels good too to fight the fire and have your next two engine come in and roll all your hose while you sit on the bumper drinking Gatorade. Yeah, but it, 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 all, it all it all it all evens out, it, yeah. you know. Then you'll get. Uh, uh, and you would definitely do the same for them, Clark. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep. Okay. So uh, <laughs> last summer, a uh, good friend of mine, a battalion chief. Uh, we were on a medical call and we missed the fire. So the guys are getting beat up and the fire's underneath the floor of a, a multiple dwelling. And they were having to bust up a tile and uh, get up. Uh, the fire found the plumbing. So it's, it's, and it's, the heat index is incredible. So uh, way into the incident, uh, they're operating on the tactical frequency. So way into the incident, they dispatched us. And I'm thinking, maybe it's just to roll hose. You know, maybe, maybe that's 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 what they need us for. So I asked on the radio, I switched over to the tactical frequency and asked the incident commander if you know if they if we wanted to respond uh with lights and siren, you know, maybe something bad happened. He says, <laughs> Get over here! It's hot outside. That was that was Todd Garafalo, but you know we was on the tack frequency. But I thought I thought that was pretty funny. When we got there, those guys looked like drowned rats, man. Okay, we got about five minutes more. Um, Clark, any closing thoughts? Uh, I think the energy drink thing, although I didn't think about that for the agenda, 
I think uh, it could be a um, that kind of self-destructive behavior and those types of things uh, could be a, a Google Hangout in of itself. But uh, excellent point. Any anything else you want to share with us? Uh, yeah. Uh, any any chief officers, you know, battalion chiefs, captains listening to this. Hey, it's up. It's up to us. It is up to us to protect our people. And fortunately, I have a good enough relationship with my battalion chief that we're rolling to a fire. I can easily call and just recommend, hey, chief, what do you say we put a couple engines on here just because of the extreme conditions we're going to be fighting fire? Just have a couple extra guys in rehab so we continually rotate people out and have some heads up guys that write policies. I'm looking at my policy right now, Cap. I have a nine-page policy on rehab. We have a nine-page SOP just on rehab, how much water you're supposed to drink, how many minutes you're supposed to work, how many balls you're allowed to work. The whole thing is laid out all the way from the chief, the dispatch, to the, the paramedic on scene who is in charge of uh, the rehab station. And the paramedic paramedic in our, in our department, per this policy, the paramedic can supersede the captain's rank. If the paramedic says you're not going in because your vitals are not stable, then you don't go in. And no matter what that, whatever that captain says, right, that paramedic says, nope, I've got the final say. And the policy has it written in there that the paramedic is the one who makes that decision. So it starts at the very top with the policymakers, and then it goes all the way down to the captains. And these people are there to protect us. If I'm a company officer and someone, the paramedic says, hey, you guys aren't fit to fight fire, you know, of course, 20 years ago, I said, hey, man, screw you. We're going back in. But now a little older, a little more mature. Hey, you're right. You're right. This is not healthy. Someone's going to get hurt if we operate like this. Let's listen to these guys who have the big degrees and the big brains, and let's let them make the decisions for us. So, you know, just make sure you take care of your people. Everyone here said it. Everyone on this panel said it. Take care of the people. Take care of your people. That's all I got for you. Thanks. Thanks, Clark. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, visiting you next month. Daryl, I ought to be going to your place. Instead of <laughs> yeah. Maybe I just uh, well, go west and end up in Oakland. It might be up to 69 degrees now. Um, it, 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 what a sharp contrast we have. Uh, rehab is almost unheard of in, in my neck of the woods. It, it's going to have to be a greater alarm, long duration uh, job for us to uh, start talking about rehab. And then there's really no policy. It's just going to be calling out uh, Red Cross. That'll bring out some, uh, you know, usually coffee <laughs> and things like that. And uh, we got some water bottles in the rig, but uh, uh, people are, we just don't experience that enough. People just work work their tail off and uh, they'll be on the nozzle and right out to grab a pike pole and getting right back to work. And, and that's, uh, that's our culture. So, uh, and it will catch us you know, time to time when we have unusual uh, weather conditions. And the biggest thing going on with us right now is the first of this month, we changed our work schedule. And uh, it concerns me. It's now a 48 hour work schedule with uh, it used to be 24 on and 48 off. And now it's 48 on and 96 off. Um, some people find some personal benefit to that. But it concerns me if if the battalion or or some your part of the city has a a long duration uh, event like this, and let's see how it's going to be on the second day. I haven't experienced that yet, but uh, I think we should really be limiting the amount of time people members are working rather than than lengthening that. But uh, time will tell. Uh, anyway, that's about it. Yeah. Chief Floy, uh, you said some spent some of your best years as a partner. Uh, I'm on engine two or aerial two at the time. You were on rescue two. Uh, I, I don't know how often you work the straight 48 on rescue two, <laughs> but when you're running 16 to 20 calls a day and most of those are EMS transports, man, I, I just, I, I don't see the, the 48. I'm sure there's some good reasons for it, but what's your opinion, boy? I, I would hate to know that um, in my time riding a rescue ambulance in Miami-Dade, some of those stations, I would have been sentenced to 48 on a continual basis. To get through it a once every now and then working a swap is one thing, but to have that as a normal schedule on 2 or 7 or 19 or 29, it would not be good for your mental health as well as your physical health. 
mental health too. Yeah, it's a beat down. It's it's a hey, beat hey, down. If I'm if I may address one little thing that was absolutely uh, was things, but the um you know we've all been there and and and, and I know what you're talking about what, with the rehab because I've experienced it before with uh, concerned uh, community members uh, worrying that their firemen are <laughs> loafing around. But I think that that goes to support the uh, to support the formalized process of rehab when you have firefighters, responders, whatever, um, with aid being given, being monitored, see things going on versus a half a dozen guys loafing under a tree is a perception. We all know they're trying to get shade and cool down, but it's perception. So I think that, and that's a, something that is important for, for uh, members at my level management to relay to the community. And it reinforces the fact of having a formalized process so it's defensible. And if you have those uh, concerned citizens, you can explain to them the benefits of the 1584 standard and, and the health of, you know, it's not just this call. It may be your house in an hour and a half. These guys got to respond to this on fire or some type of significant medical emergency. So, and uh, on the sports drinks, I do want to go back to that bill and I'll get with you offline, but you know, Dudley Carson that does the, I had him do the, um, all the flight physiology and crew crew resource yeah, management yeah, class. Yeah. He has a very excellent thing on the, um, the the detriments of the sports drinks, and I'll give you his information. It might be something you guys may want to want to revisit on there and invite him. Uh, I want you to come back. I hope you come back, and uh, we'll discuss uh, rural water supply. But you know, yeah. really, it's it's. You're not really in a rural area. I mean, you're in a metropolitan area. You just sure. don't have any. Uh, you don't have any hydrants. Yeah, that's and, correct. And um, the other thing that amazes me are these departments that. Uh, well, our, I'm very proud to say, we we got an ISO class two uh, rating uh, when we have vast areas of Miami Dade County without any hydrants. That's but correct. We, we did demonstrate the ISO that we could maintain that minimum flow of, I believe it's 500 gallons a minute. Mm -hmm. You would know better than me uh, with tanker shovels and, of course, relays. But uh, I'd love to have you back. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate it. Captain Mike, okay. any closing thoughts? Yeah, Bill. Uh, my closing thought is one of my last – uh, tours before I went on light duty after getting hurt was a July um, where I had four fires in the 24 hour period. It was weather like this. It was hot. And uh, the last job just kicked my butt. We were on a top floor pulling ceilings and listen to your people, listen to your body. And I probably shouldn't have been at that last fire because walking up there and going to rehab and everything else. And I got back to the firehouse and I couldn't even drive home. I was so beat up. So listen to your body, listen to your people, listen to what's going on. And listen, we all want to go to fires and I understand that, but you don't want to be the guy or the girl that has a heart issue at that fire where you're going to have it for the rest of your life. Probably was one of the stupidest things I've done in my career but something to think about, okay? Listen to what's going on and pay attention to it. Because if you do that, sometimes people don't come back from that. Mike, you know, I hear you loud and clear, and, and I am going to take your advice because I'm a lead instructor in our officer development program, and I think we need to put a greater emphasis on what you just mentioned is uh, – looking out for your people and making sure that they're not overworked, overheated and properly rehabbed. And you got to be the one to do it. Uh, young, strong firefighters are very reluctant to say, Hey, Cap, I got to take a knee. I, 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 I got to take just a little bit of rest. They're not going to say that. So it's, it's up to the officer. Um, I want to thank key again, our sponsor, uh, as I've mentioned in previous hump day hangouts, that uh, this is a very easy endorsement for me because um, I see it in use or have my hands on it every day. I'm the manager of our two-inch hose standpipe uh, project, 
where we are transitioning uh, to the two inch hose uh, key uh, combat ready. And again, take the key challenge and try to kink this stuff. You will not be successful. Next month, working cooperatively with the unsung heroes of the fire service, the fire alarm office dispatchers. We'll be looking forward to it. Until then, stay cool, stay safe. God bless.